Hi, my name is Amir Salari and I'm a postdoc at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Michigan. This project is about the most hazardous segments of the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, here I'm going to discuss some of uh, our results regarding the uh, coastal as well as source features that are going to affect the propagation of tsunamis uh, in the region. Um, so what do we know about the Cascadia subduction zone? Well, everything has started as we know uh, with the 1700 earthquake and its impact across all the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so everything uh, else ever since has been thousands and thousands of efforts at reconstructing the uh, sort of propagation of tsunamis sort of uh, in, in, the, in the region and in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, so there are two ways to approach this. One obviously is going to be the worst case scenario, kind of an, uh, you know, ace in a hole. And that's going to be, well, the plate interface here that I'm showing with this sort of a mesh here, uh, arguably it could be uh, extended further south. It could rupture through a one big earthquake, uh, probably a magnitude nine plus earthquake, kind of magnitude 9.2. But the other approach is that, well, this whole thing could not break. I mean, this could be break in smaller chunks uh, at different locations. And this idea is uh, sort of pioneered by Ando back in 1975. And in the study of Nankai Trough, he proposed the idea that this uh, plate interface can break in different blocks. And if you know some statistics, you can actually, uh, kind of quote unquote predict uh, the distribution of uh, the, 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 fla the failure of these blocks and the frequency of the earthquakes. Uh, this has been done uh, a large number of times ever, ever since and people have used these uh, kind of uh, rupture models, rupture propagations and earthquake locations as the input for tsunami simulations as initial conditions. Uh, but all of these things, uh, all you, most of these methods, what they do is that they're site specific. They consider a site, for example, here I'm uh, looking at Astoria in, uh, in Oregon, and I take earthquakes from all across uh, the plate interface and try to model using hydrodynamic simulations, uh, the, you know, how big of a tsunami will this point observe. And in order to do this, I get earthquakes across all the plate interface all different shapes and sizes of rupture, and I can make these earthquakes uh, and tsunamis in order to uh, uh, study the tsunami hazard at this one site. Here, what we're doing is that we are trying to look at the subduction uh, in Cascadia as a whole. We try to sort of figure out which parts of the subduction are more hazardous, as opposed to uh, what are the scenarios under which you can get large, ampli at large amplitudes at one single site. In order to do this well, for the initial condition of our problems, we uh, consider this uh, sort of a locking model, gamma, so-called locking model from Gina Schmalz's work uh, back in nine, uh, 2014. And from this, using simple earthquake scaling equations, I can scale down uh, the slip field to get smaller and smaller earthquakes. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, I can go down to any magnitude that I want. This doesn't mean that uh, this entire plate interface like this will break as a magnitude uh, in a magnitude eight earthquake. What it means that this is the available pool of a slip that I will have available during that one single earthquake um, that you, you'll, you'll get, for example, for magnitude nine, I can <clears throat> start from this uh, high latitude as the epicenter of the earthquake and I can propagate the rupture further south until I saturate the magnitude nine and I'll stop there. And this is what one magnitude nine earthquake scenario. For the other scenarios, I can just move down the epicenter one row down and I can propagate the rupture and uh, you know, similar story. And here, it, here you go. These are my rupture scenarios for magnitude nine. And it turns out that all of these rupture scenarios, if I just add them up, they follow a Gutenberg and Richter like distribution uh, as a whole catalog. And this is because I'm working with rupture surface areas as opposed to magnitude alone. And this sort of a kind of a built in property of all of this uh, uh, setup. Now I can use uh, these initial conditions to propagate, to simulate my tsunamis using hydrodynamic simulations. And here I, I'm showing the cumulative maps of maximum tsunami wave height from all, all kinds of scenarios here. I'm showing for magnitude 8, 8.5, 9, 9.2. And these are again, cumulative maps. And what I've, you know, you can note in all of this is that well, local amplitude peaks, uh, there is a local amplitude peak here in the center in the absence of otherwise irregular bathymetric feature. And magnitude nine is not significantly different from magnitude 9.2. Granted, the amplitudes are much smaller, uh, but the distribution of these amplitudes doesn't seem to be very different. In fact, you can use this sort of a fancier uh, metric called MT, which basically compares tsunami amplitudes in these maps uh, with each other. And it tells me that um, Magnitude, uh, after magnitude nine, you don't really see much of a difference because it has a smaller magnitude, and, uh, I'm sorry, smaller MT. And smaller MT means that the two maps are very, very similar. Um, so this is about a four-ish field, uh, sort of you know, uh, in the Pacific, not very close to the coastline, but what about the coastal tsunami amplitudes? Well, what I can do is that I can uh, plot um, 
coastal tsunami amplitudes along uh, the uh, uh, US and Canada west coast. Uh, here, this is the map on the bottom are just the exact same thing that I showed you before. I just sort of flipped the map on its side. And on the top bits of these two panels, I'm showing uh, coastal tsunami amplitudes for magnitude 7.5 and magnitude 8 scenarios. They're color coded according to the, um, the epicenter of the earthquake. The meshes here, for example, are also reflect the um, the coastal, uh, the corresponding coastal tsunami amplitude curve, depending on the epicenter of, uh, again, of, of, of the earthquake. The black curve in both figures are uh, coastal tsunami amplitudes from a quote unquote worst case tsunami scenario as magnitude 9.2. And uh, I can jack up the uh, earthquakes and magnitude of earthquake scenarios. Again, you can see that for magnitude 8.5. It's reasonable. Uh, there is the distribution of magnitude, uh, coastal tsunami amplitudes in the north is more localized than in the south. And again, for magnitude nine, it's interesting because for magnitude nine, it seems that I'm almost saturating the amplitude, coastal tsunami amplitudes that I would get from magnitude 9.2. And uh, another important feature in all of this is that um, uh, for a um, central segments of the subduction zone make wider spans of high amplitudes. In other words, if I put that, uh, Again, as I pointed out, if I put the epicenter in the middle segments as opposed to the top segments in the in the north, I get wider ranges of large amplitudes. And uh, magnitude magnitude uh, nine already almost saturates the north at, at least the northern coastal tsunami amplitudes. But uh, again, the maximum amplitude is this peak here along the, uh, the uh, along the uh, coast of uh, Oregon. And so what's causing all of this? Well, the first thing, I mean, I have to just get it out of the way, is the sca scaling equation. Obviously, the different sets of scaling equations will result in different amount of slip. Calculated from magnitude and different amount of slip will result in a different amount of uh, surface uh, ocean floor dislocation and, of course, obviously, the tsunami amplitudes. Uh, so here I'm comparing coastal tsunami amplitudes from two different sets of models. One is from... Uh, uh, the Geller, uh, the, the work of Bob Geller, and the other one is the, uh, from the work of uh, Tengbaijom uh, Teng et al. Uh, a couple of years ago. And you can see that while they obviously have different amplitudes and note the different scales on both sides, uh, they have very similar trends. And uh, so the choice of rupture uh, scaling equation doesn't really affect the distribution. It's just a sort of a measure of absolute tsunami amplitude as it was shown before. Uh, what about the choice of slip model? Well, here uh, on the left, I'm comparing uh, what we have used so far, the gamma model from Gina's work back in 2014, and uh, I'm comparing it to the, uh, the, the a simpler one uh, by George Priest back in 2010. In the middle, I'm comparing the same thing on the right to the dynamic rupture, uh, what we've uh, obtained using uh, dynamic rupture simulations. And on the right, I'm just introducing a sort of a white noise through this uh, uh, rupture that we've, uh, the sort of model that we're, we're using. And this is just a noisier, sort of a randomized version of that. And I can use tsunami simulation codes to, uh, to simulate the tsunami. And again, you see this scenario is very different from the rest. And in fact, if I show you the uh, coastal distribution of coastal tsunami amplitudes, you can see that here they're pretty similar. They have more or less uh, similar trends, the peak in the middle, kind of a smoother distribution around. Same thing here. Uh, there is a sort of a bigger mismatch in the south. Uh, which is caused, I, uh, as you would think, by the, the absence of this sort of a large cluster of slip. Uh, these two scenarios uh, have correlation coefficients of larger than 75.75. Uh, the difference, the huge difference, again, is the one on the right. Uh, and uh, from all of this, what uh, you can deduce is that as long as you're keeping the large scale slip, slip clusters the same, uh, the choice of rupture model doesn't matter in the near field. You can uh, tweak the rupture model for a better match of slip, but again, it doesn't really uh, matter in the near field uh, in terms of the trend of, uh, of the distribution of coastal tsunami amplitudes. Uh, another thing is rupture directivity. As has been shown recently, uh, you can show that the you know, uh, directivity of rupture, um, you know, the speed of rupture and its uh, uh, direction of uh, slip uh, doesn't really matter. You can simulate the tsunami uh, and you can, uh, if you compare in, in all of these plots, the black curves are static, uh, are maximum coastal tsunami amplitudes from static rupture, but the colored uh, uh, curves are those from ruptures with different uh, directivities and different uh, uh, propagation patterns. Uh, there are outliers to, uh, to, to this. The, these two are, all of them are the same or very, very similar. The, the outliers are these two, which are caused by very narrow ruptures. And this could be a numerical artifact of our simulations. So the effective rupture directivity does not have a significant effect in the near field. What about uh, the coastal morphology? Well, you can set up a bunch of numerical experiments to see the peculiar shape of Cascadia coastline 
uh, how it affects the tsunami uh, propagation. Well, here I'm making a flat ocean next to a narrow continental, shallower continental shelf next to a coastline. And I can change the curvature of the coastline by changing the radius of the geographic circle uh, of which it's a part of. And at each step for each of these fake oceans, I can simulate a tsunami uh, use, uh, from this sort of a linear rupture uh, that you can see here in red. And in each case, I can I'm here on the right, I'm showing the maximum tsunami uh, wave height uh, from, from that, uh, from that uh, ocean and coastal morphology. And you can see that in the middle, you have this peak and you have two uh, uh, secondary peaks around it. And there are other things around uh, just uh, as you move away from the center. But uh, what this tells me that the coastal morphology, the curvature of the coastline focuses the energy of edge wave modes uh, on the uh, sort of shallow continental shelf. And you can see large tsunami amplitudes in the nadir. Of, uh, of the curved coastline. Uh, you can show that the curvature can increase the coastal uh, amplitudes by in fact more than 10%. And uh, well, similar analysis can be carried out for convex coastal morphology, uh, other subduction zones, zones such as Chile, for example. Uh, if you test this hypothesis in the uh, real world, uh, here uh, there is Cascadia, this is my best effort at reproducing the boundaries of the Cascadia subduction zone in blue and the red, Circle is the geographic uh, curvature uh, of uh, of the Cascadia coastline. You see, there's a nice match here. Here on the right, I'm showing the, the coastal curvature or the circle of the curvature of the northern Chile, where it has produced historically several magnitude eight plus earthquakes and tsunamis. And you can see this is why uh, you don't really see this focusing of energy, for example, in Chile because of its very very large radius of curvature. Now here in the bottom, I'm, what I'm showing is that I'm comparing coastal. Uh, tsunami amplitude to the maximum coastal tsunami amplitude to the surface uh, maximum surface deformation in each case. And uh, I'm comparing it to the uh, ratio between rupture length and radius. I'm doing this to sort of take into account the contribution of the uh, ratio between the rupture length and the coastal radius. And as you can see, Cascadia here is well to the right, whereas Chile is not even showing up here. So Cascadia, in, in terms of Cascadia, this effect would be more pronounced. Now, how does this contribute? Uh, to uh, uh, the hazard on the coast, along the coastline or that what we expect from our models is that uh, here on the, on the left, I'm showing some, uh, this is a similar map that I showed you before. Here I have some sites and at each site, I can calculate the, the ratio of the, the tsunami scenarios or the rupture, the rupture scenarios that produce tsunamis 50% larger uh, larger than 50% of that of the magnitude 9.2. And two things at least to show up in this plot. One is that after magnitude about 8.7, 8.9, you don't really see any uh, big difference. You're already saturating. And there is this cluster of separate uh, behavior. And that's for Fort Bragg, Eureka, and Crescent City. And this is done because of the promontory here. And the convex morphology of the coastline is sort of, uh, sort of uh, dispersing the energy of the edge waves, uh, again, because of the coastal morphology. And so as a result of all of this, there are, uh, again, uh, there are three important take home messages. One is that the Cascadia, uh, uh, the worst case tsunami center in Cascadia is not necessarily magnitude 9.2. Uh, again, uh, the near field effects of Cascadia tsunamis are not very sensitive uh, uh, to the choice of rupture model and rupture with hypocenters as central segments of, the, uh, uh, of Cascadia make larger tsunami uh, scenarios. And concave morphology of the Cascadia coastline makes a big difference. Thanks for tuning in.